Welcome to Banking 101, a first principle jargon free course on banking. No discussion on banking is complete without an overview of regulation as banks are one of the most highly regulated entities globally. In this final lesson of the course, we will learn why banks are regulated, the type of regulations they are subject to and the methods by which they are regulated. The regulatory framework for each country is different. Hence, this lesson is focused on the foundational concepts and not the details on how these concepts are implemented. Governments regulate banks for two sets of reasons. The first set relate to safety and soundness. Most banks raise deposits from the public and to the extent these deposits are invested in poor assets, depositors can end up losing money. Further, if the public at large, loses confidence in one bank, it can generate a chain reaction of depositors withdrawing money from other banks. Second, the government uses the banking system to achieve social and economic objectives. Regulation may be used to promote positives, for example, financial inclusion or green energy transition or prevent negatives, like financing of crimes. To understand the rationale for safety and soundness regulation, consider a bank that sources deposits of $100 each from three depositors, Tom, Alice, and Mary. It deploys the funds raised by making loans of $100 each to two borrowers, a dry cleaner and restaurant. It keeps cash of $100. Now Mary comes to the bank to withdraw her deposit. So far so good. But what if Tom, Alice and Mary all come to withdraw their deposits at the same time? The bank is out of money then. Fractional reserve banking refers to a system where banks hold only a portion of deposits in cash. This causes the risk of a run on the bank if depositors lose faith. Many countries have a system of deposit insurance where the government insures deposits up to a specified amount. Banks that accept deposits pay insurance premiums to the government. However, the goal of regulation is to prevent the financial circumstances of banks from going so bad. Consider a bank that serves residents from a poor neighborhood and a rich neighborhood. Without any regulatory oversight, the bank may choose to ignore serving the poorer residents. The government may impose regulation that either mandates or encourages banks to serve the banking needs of underprivileged communities. This is an example of a regulation that is outside the safety and soundness objectives. There are three major categories of regulations that apply to banks. Safety and soundness related regulations are called prudential regulations. Regulations related to social and economic objectives are non prudential regulations. In addition, we have seen that many of the larger banks have asset management and investment banking divisions. Such banks are subject to markets regulations related to securities and commodities. An overview of market regulations is outside the scope of this lesson. We will begin this lesson with a look at prudential regulations. The first set of prudential regulations involve restricting banks from certain activities. However, all economic activity carries risk. Hence capital adequacy regulations ensure that banks have enough funds of their own so that if there are losses on loans, the bank can absorb the losses, without depositors taking a haircut. Additionally, we have seen that banks lend over long time periods but borrow on short tenures. For instance, depositors can withdraw money from demand deposits anytime. Liquidity requirements are imposed on banks to manage this risk. Regulators, not only, impose outcomes like capital adequacy and liquidity, they also influence the process by which banks assume and manage risk. We will classify such regulations under the umbrella of governance regulations. We will now cover each type of regulations briefly. Restriction on activity may be broad-based or fine-grained. An example of broad-based restriction is the historical separation of banking and commerce in the U.S. A bank may be permitted to enter into adjacent financial services like insurance but cannot own, say, a chain of supermarkets. Restrictions can be more fine-grained within a particular sphere of banking activity. For instance, as individuals we can engage in proprietary trading, which we means we can buy securities like shares and bonds, with a view to sell them later at a higher price. In the U.S., a rule called the Volcker Rule prevents banks from engaging in proprietary trading. Capital adequacy is a measure of whether a bank has sufficient funds of its own, meaning, shareholder-owned funds, to absorb foreseeable losses on loans and investments. Next, we will consider an example. Let us go back to George and our fictional bank trust bank. The bank, like any other bank, borrows, mostly from depositors and deploys the funds in loans and investments. What happens if some of the borrowers cannot repay their loan? Then, Trust Bank would not be able to repay depositors, if the latter wanted to withdraw cash. However, since Trust Bank has its own funds of 10, it can cover the first $10 of losses without impacting depositors. Regulatory capital is the amount of internally generated capital, 
as opposed to borrowed funds, that a bank must maintain as per regulatory requirements. It includes proceeds from equity issuance as well as any accumulated profits over time. The requirement is expressed as a percentage of risk-weighted assets. Next, we will explore the concept of risk-weighted assets. Consider a regulator who is examining Bank 1, which has total assets of 100, of which 90 are invested in government securities and 10 is held as cash. This bank has made no loans to businesses. Now the regulator examines Bank 2, which also has total assets of 100, but 90 is lent to businesses and 10 is kept as cash. While both banks have the same asset size, there is a greater likelihood that businesses will default on their loans compared with the government defaulting on its debt. Hence, it is only fair that Bank 2 should assign higher regulatory capital. The regulatory capital formula works like this. First you multiply the exposure to an asset class, say credit card loans with the risk weight attached to it. Say that number turns out to be $10 billion. Then you multiply with a percentage requirement dictated by the regulator, say 8%. Then regulatory capital requirement is $8 million. This seems deceptively simple but the calculation can be very complex. The risk weights can be very granular. A loan that is backed by collateral, for instance, will have a lower risk weight than an unsecured loan. Regulators in different countries may allow different levels of complexity in how this is calculated and even within a country, bigger banks may use more complex methodologies than smaller banks. Large global banks can have large teams doing regulatory capital calculation, besides the effort required to ensure that the underlying data on exposures is correct in source systems. Why bother to spend so much effort on this? To understand why capital is expensive, intuitively, we will take the example of Tom who wants to buy a property for investment purposes. His plan is to buy a home and give it out for rent. The home costs $100,000 and the rent is $5,000 a year, giving a rental yield of 5%. Tom has two options. In option 1, he finances the entire purchase with a loan at 2% interest. In option 2, the lender forces him to put 20% of the value of the home as down payment. In other words, this is equivalent to regulatory capital, the percentage of the asset that Tom must finance on his own. In option 1 and 2, Tom's rental revenue remains the same. His interest expense in option 1 is 2000 and he makes a net profit of 3000 In option 2, his interest expense is lower because the loan is lower. But what is the cost of his own equity? It so happens that Tom had been keeping his savings invested in a low-cost equity mutual fund where he was getting long-term returns of 5% per annum. By being forced to set aside idle cash of $20,000 as capital, he is effectively losing 5% on this sum which equals $1,000. We can now say that Tom's net profit on option 2 gets lowered. Regulatory capital has the same impact on a bank's profitability. Just as Tom has an opportunity cost, the bank has opportunity cost of holding up capital raised from shareholders and accumulated profits. However, we can see why regulatory capital makes Tom's financial condition safer. If Tom is not able to find a renter for a couple of months, he has less debt to pay off. The same impact occurs on banks. Their appetite for risk reduces, especially, since the amount of capital they have to set aside increases with the riskiness of the assets they are investing in. Banks are required to set aside capital because they are exposed to risks, which can result in losses. There are three principal risks banks provision capital for. These are credit risk, market risk and operational risk. Let us look at each one. Credit risk is the risk of financial loss because another party cannot honor its contractual commitments. The simplest scenario of credit risk is the risk of a borrower not paying back principal or interest. But credit risk can arise from counterparties where no loan is made. For instance, we saw in the lesson on payments that one bank can be exposed to credit risk from another bank that fails to settle a payment. Banks face credit risk across consumer, wholesale, asset management and investment banking. Market risk is the risk of making losses arising from movements in market-determined prices like interest rates, foreign exchange rates, securities prices, commodity prices. Market risk is harder to understand than credit risk. So we will repeat an example from the previous lesson. Alice is the CFO of a bank who buys a bond issued by the U.S. government. The credit risk of the U.S. government defaulting on its debt is very low. The face value of the bond is $100 and the investor gets repaid this principal amount in 10 years. The investor is also entitled to interest at 1% per annum, which gets paid at the end of each year she holds the bond. This rate, called the coupon, is fixed. A year passes and now interest rates in the economy have increased. From mortgage lenders to credit card issuers, everybody is demanding higher rates.
the bank needs cash and wishes to sell this bond. No one is willing to buy a security that only yields 1% a year. The only way Alice can sell this bond is by selling at a discount to the face value of the bond. For example, if she sells at 95, then effectively she has added $5 to the buyer's returns. When the government redeems the bond on maturity, the buyer gets 100 of principal but the buyer paid only 95. Even if the bank didn't need to sell the bond for cash, the bank effectively locked up funds at a lower rate than prevailing market rates. This hurts the bank's profits as the bank is likely paying higher rates on deposits but is stuck with a low yielding investment for 10 years. This is an example of market risk arising from interest rates. Operational risk is the risk of loss resulting from failures of people, process and technology. Operational risk covers a wide spectrum. Banks can incur losses by breaking laws and regulations that are applicable to countries they operate in. They can be subject to cyber attacks which can result in both direct loss of funds and indirect loss through costs of remediation. Human error can cause losses, say sending out funds by mistake. The total regulatory capital banks maintain is thus a sum of the regulatory capital they need to set aside for possible losses from credit risk, market risk and operational risk. Capital adequacy measurement is a vast topic. You can see on the page some examples of regulatory measures in the U.S. The specific measurements and methodology would vary by country. The purpose of this lesson is not to learn the mechanics of regulations but getting familiar with the basic concepts. We are now ready to move on from capital regulation to liquidity requirements. To understand liquidity requirements, let us go back to our earlier example of Trust Bank. So far, we have learned that Trust Bank is required by regulators to set aside capital in the event it experiences losses on account of credit, market and operational risk. This way, depositors or the deposit insurer wouldn't have to foot the bill for the losses up to the amount of capital set aside. But what if Trust Bank is operating without incurring any losses but suddenly depositors start coming to withdraw money in large numbers? Perhaps they believe some unfounded rumors. Since only a portion of the depositor's funds is held in cash, the bank will have to start selling securities and maybe ask some borrowers to repay their loans, so that Trust Bank can pay back its depositors. This would not be a good situation. Liquidity risk is the risk that a firm will not be able to efficiently meet expected and unexpected cash outflows without adversely impacting the firm. Imagine you had a sudden need for cash but your funds were locked up in the stocks at a time when there was a downturn in the markets. You would be forced to sell your stocks at a loss to meet your cash needs. The same thing can happen to a firm. In the previous lesson, we had learned that banks borrow on the short end of the yield curve but deploy funds on the long end. This, in addition to fractional reserve banking, exposes banks to liquidity risk. Banks, thus get subjected to regulation related to liquidity requirements. Regulators expect banks to manage their liquidity risk by closely tracking the volume of assets that are maturing within a defined period and the volume of liabilities that are expected to mature within the same period. Banks are commonly subject to two common measures of liquidity. These are the liquidity coverage ratio and net stable funding ratio. The first is focused on the short term and the second on the long term. Next, we will take a brief look at each one. While the specifics of how they are calculated could vary by jurisdiction, in this lesson, we are only focused on gaining a conceptual understanding of these measures. The liquidity coverage ratio or LCR is a calculated ratio whose numerator contains high quality liquid assets. This includes cash and high credit quality securities that can be quickly sold for cash, for example, government securities. The denominator is the bank's expectation of net cash outflows over a 30-day period. Stable funding refers to deposits, long-term borrowings and shareholder capital. It excludes any short-term funding. The numerator of this measure is the sum total of stable funding. For the denominator, the banks have to calculate the amount of stable funding required based on the characteristics of its loans and investments. So far, we have seen that regulators ensure safety and soundness of banks by placing restrictions on the type of economic activities they can engage in and forcing them to meet certain quantitative outcomes related to capital and liquidity. But regulators go one step further and place demands on the way banks govern their operations with the objective of maintaining safety and soundness. These are governance regulations. Governance regulations that promote safety and soundness is a vast category. So, we will only discuss a few illustrative examples. One category of regulations prescribes standards by which banks must manage risks. For instance, in some countries, banks may be asked to set up an independent risk committee that reports directly to the board of directors and monitors the risk policies of the bank. While regulators do not decide whom a bank should lend to, 
they may prescribe procedures like documenting an annual credit review of all borrowers. Banks are subject to rules related to lending to senior executives of banks as well transactions with affiliated entities, so that a bank does not offer preferential terms to favored parties. Regulators, in some jurisdictions, may also have a say on executive appointments and compensation. Banks may be asked to maintain detailed plans that document how they would need to be shut down in case of a bankruptcy-like situation. These are called living wills. This brings us to the end of the section on prudential regulations. We will now move on to an overview of non-prudential regulations, whose objective is to promote social and economic objectives set by the government. As stated earlier, market regulations are outside the scope of this course. Non-prudential regulation of banks globally caters to three common objectives. First is consumer protection, which means protecting consumers from fraudulent or unfair business practices. Second is prevention of money laundering. Third is direction of credit to sectors that the government deems to be important, for example small business, higher education or housing. We will look at each one of these briefly. Consumer protection regulation across the globe can be categorized into four broad groups based on the objectives they serve. Disclosure, fair treatment and privacy-oriented regulation are meant to protect customers in their dealings with banks. But regulation can also be forward-looking and aimed to foster innovation that benefits consumers with better products and lower cost. We will now look into each one of these. Disclosure regulations mandate disclosures on loan terms to consumers, including interest rate and late fees. Disclosures may also be mandated on deposit accounts and associated terms. Regulations also could apply to advertising of financial products to consumers and prevention of misleading statements. Fair treatment in the context of banking regulation means two different things. One is prevention of discrimination. An example of this would be laws that make it illegal to deny credit on grounds of demographic characteristics like race and gender. The other meaning of fair treatment would mean ensuring customers are dealt with fairly at the level of a transaction. An example of such a regulation would be the right of an individual to get a direct debit reversed within a stipulated period of time. At the transactional level, we can think of fairness in a broader sense of protecting customers from financial loss for no fault of theirs. For example, Regulations that require banks to implement two-factor authentication for payment initiation can also be included in this umbrella. Privacy regulations, like other regulations, vary across countries. Banks are subject to general privacy regulations that all businesses are subject to. However, there are some common themes that emerge in bank-specific privacy regulation. These include mandates on banks to establish privacy policies and procedures. Some regulations require banks to provide notice of privacy policies to all consumers on an ongoing basis. Laws can also specify what the notices should cover. For instance, the nature of information a bank collects as well as what it can disclose to third parties. Regulations may also require banks to give consumers an opportunity to opt out of sharing specific types of information with third parties. The focus of regulation can also be to promote innovation. For example, open banking regulation in Europe and the UK required large banks to allow secure access via APIs to third parties subject to customer consent. This allows third parties to offer services in competition to banks. For instance, a peer-to-peer payment app can connect to the bank account of a user to seek authorization for a payment. This allows the user to make a payment without logging into her own bank account. This graphic shows the plethora of consumer protection laws that exist in the United States. Every country has its own version of this. We can now move on from consumer protection to another big area of non-prudential regulation, anti-money laundering. Money laundering is the disguise of funds received from illegal activity, in a form, that makes it appear that it is being received from legitimate sources. The goal of anti-money laundering regulation is to prevent money laundering and terrorist financing. A major problem criminals face is that they are forced to accept payments in cash and it is difficult to store large amounts of cash safely. Next, we will review an example of how a bank can easily become a vehicle for money laundering unintentionally. Tom runs a food truck. The nature of the business is such that many customers pay cash. However, Tom's primary source of revenue is dealing illicit drugs. Tom receives payments for his drug sales in cash. Tom deposits cash in his bank account every week. The bank thinks that this is cash generated from his food truck business. Once the funds are deposited into the bank, From that point they can said to have been laundered into something that looks clean. Anti-money laundering regulation typically center around two broad areas. One is customer due diligence. Banks are required to make reasonable determinations on whether the individuals and businesses they are working with are not engaged in illegal activity. Second, 
they are not only expected to weed out suspicious customers but also flag any suspicious transactions. Let's dig into each one. Customer due diligence, at the most basic level, means that your customers are who they say are. This is called Know Your Customer or KYC. For individuals, it means verifying their identity and address records against documents like driver's licenses and passports. For legal entities, it means verifying not just the formation documents of the entity and its nature of business, but also verifying the identity of the entity's beneficial owners and key executives. Banks are also required to screen customers against lists of individuals and entities that are sanctioned by the government. A well-known list is the OFAC list. This is list of sanctioned individuals, entities and foreign governments maintained by the Office of Foreign Assets Control, a department within the U.S. government's Department of Treasury. Despite every effort at customer due diligence, there is no guaranteed method to ensure that a customer won't engage in criminal activity. Hence banks are required to monitor suspicious activity and inform the concerned regulatory authorities. In our previous example, if Tom usually deposited $2,000 per week but suddenly came to the bank wanting to deposit $50,000 in cash, any bank would treat this as a suspicious activity. Banks are also prohibited from tipping off their clients. Hence, the bank is likely to accept the deposit and then file a report with the appropriate statutory authority. Many times, banks could simply be filing such reports as a defensive gesture, so that they could not be held by regulators for a miss later. Hence, many of these reports could be false positives. Banks are a channel by which a government can seek to meet its policy objectives. The government may wish to extend banking services, particularly credit, to certain sectors that it deems a priority. This could be a region of the country or a segment like small business, housing or students. In countries with more state influence on the economy, these regulations could be in the form of sectoral mandates, example, a certain percentage of a bank's lending needs to be in priority sectors. In other countries, the government may provide incentives instead of mandates. For instance, in the U.S., the Community Reinvestment Act encourages banks to offer banking services to underserved communities. Another form of priority sector lending that is common is when the state uses banks as channel for lending. For example, in the United States, the Small Business Administration, or the SBA, which is a department of the government, makes loans to small businesses. But the small business applies for loan to a bank. The bank must approve or deny the loan strictly as per the policies mandated by the SBA. These are different from the bank's own credit policies. The bank in turn gets reimbursed by the SBA. As long as the bank follow the guidelines, any losses will be incurred by the government. So far, we discussed why banks are regulated and what regulations they are subjected to. Now we can move on from the why and what to the how. The final piece of the puzzle is how regulations are enforced. Two things need to happen for effective enforcement. First, regulators must have a way of knowing whether there is a problem to begin with. Next, they must have the authority to take action. Otherwise, the regulations will not have any teeth. Let us take a quick look at each one. Regulators have two primary tools for discovery. First is demand reports and data from banks. A very well-known data reporting requirement in the U.S. is called CCAR, which stands for Comprehensive Capital Analysis and Review. Banks have to demonstrate how they calculated their regulatory capital requirement and also need to conduct stress tests. The second tool is examinations, which are audits where examiners, who are employed by regulators, review a bank's policies and procedures. There are two broad types of enforcement actions that regulators take when a company is found in violation of regulations. The first is putting restrictions on how they operate. Example include preventing payout of dividend, stopping them from growing either organically or through acquisitions, stopping them from adding a branch. The second is penalties. This could be monetary penalties. Banks may be subject to consent orders which mandate actions that banks must take and often involve hiring of external consultants. In extreme cases, regulators may withdraw deposit insurance. This brings us to the end of our lesson on banking regulation. During this lesson, we learned about the reasons banks are regulated, the type of regulations they face and the methods by which regulations are enforced. While the details of regulations vary by country, the fundamental concepts we covered in this lesson apply universally. It would be a good idea to review the summing up section of this lesson. Congratulations! On completing Banking 101, a simple but comprehensive and jargon-free course on banking.